Chapter 26, Builders and Dreamers. 19th century Americans thought they lived in the most splendid era in all of history. You can understand why. All those new cities and inventions were mighty exciting. Even the traffic jams in Chicago and New York didn't seem too bad when you considered the things you could do and see in those great cities. Americans seemed to be doing things bigger and better than had ever been done before. Some men and women started thinking about building buildings taller than any built before. But there was no point in building a really tall building because people were only willing to walk up four or maybe five flights of stairs. So that was as high as most buildings went until a Vermonter, Alicia Graves Otis, designed a safe elevator. Then, as they say, the sky was the limit. You could build tall buildings and people could ride up inside as high as the building went. In 1880, if you lived in the elegant Dakota apartment house in New York City, you could drive home in your carriage. Back into the elevator, which unhitch the horses and you and your carriage would be lifted to your apartment door. Central Park. When most people think of architecture, they think of buildings. But land can be transformed by a designer as a sculptor transforms clay or an architect's steel and stone. Frederick Law Olmsted, a great landscape architect, did just that when he designed beautiful new Central Park in New York City, America's first great city park. He had lakes dug and hills built. He made formal areas with fountains, playgrounds, and concert shells. He created rugged and wild areas. Notice that word, created. If you visit Central Park today, you may think nature made those rugged areas. Nature had a lot of help from Frederick Olmsted. Olmsted loved democracy and believed that democratic cities should have large parks for recreation and for quiet walking, open to all people. He thought that a public park should be as handsome as a king's park. It took 20 years and 3,800 men to build Central Park, but when it was finished, New York had a park for the people that was lovelier than any king's park. And now that there were elevators, tall buildings seemed just the thing for America's new cities. But if you think about it, you will realize there is a problem in building something very tall. The higher a building goes, the more it weighs. So, if you wanted to build a tall building, you had to build its walls with stone or brick or something very strong to hold the weight. Since America was becoming the world's leading steel producer, maybe it isn't surprising that some American architects came up with the idea of using steel as a frame for a building. A steel frame could hold all of the weight of a tall building. The walls didn't have to hold any weight at all, so thick walls weren't needed to support the building. Walls became just a covering, like skin. The architect was free to use almost anything, even decorated metal or glass, as the skin of a building. Luckily, when this new idea came on the scene, America produced an architect who was a genius. He was able to take that technology and combine it with artistry. His name was Louis Sullivan. Louis Sullivan has been called the inventor of the skyscraper. That is not quite true. Sullivan didn't invent tall buildings. What he did was build them beautifully. Sullivan loved nature and poetry. Like Frederick Olmsted, he too was imbued with democratic ideas. Sullivan tried to express his ideas in his architecture. He believed that the individual, each of us, is very important. It was an idea he got from reading the words of people like Thomas Jefferson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau. Louis Sullivan built tall buildings that are comfortable and human in scale. They are American buildings, not copies of European palaces. One day, a young Wisconsin-born architect named Frank Lloyd Wright came to work for Louis Sullivan. Frank Lloyd Wright became even more famous than his teacher. Many people consider Wright one of the world's greatest architects. Like his mentor, Wright was concerned with that American idea of individual worth. His buildings were meant to make life more enjoyable for all who use them. They often seem a part of the landscape. That's because the architect thought a lot about the natural environment and the ways that people have always lived. One of Wright's homes is built over a brook. Another was inspired by an Indian pueblo. 
Other things besides buildings needed to be built in America. Rivers needed to be crossed. A German immigrant, John Augustus Roebling, came up with one of the best new ideas. He knew that steel is not only strong, it is flexible. He twisted thin steel wires together and made strong steel cable. That opened up all kinds of new ways to build things. Roebling decided that a bridge could be suspended, which means hung, from steel cable attached to concrete and stone towers. Roebling designed the world's first modern suspension bridges. Actually, his bridges were similar in idea to the rope foot bridges the Indians built in Central America 1,000 years ago. Except that Roebling built bridges strong enough to support railroad trains and cross mighty rivers. But when he suggested a bridge across New York's East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan, most people thought he had lost his mind. It would be the longest and highest bridge ever built anywhere in the world. It would have to withstand powerful winds and ocean tides. Experts said it was impossible. The stone towers needed to anchor the steel rope could not be placed on land. The distance from shore to shore was too great. The towers would have to be built in the river. No one was quite sure how that could be done. New construction methods would have to be developed. Well, it was done. It was called the Brooklyn Bridge, and it took 14 years to build. It demanded courage from financiers who believed in the idea and raised the money. Some were corrupt and made scandalous profits, from workmen who risked their lives, and from John Roebling who lost his life after his toes were crushed in a construction accident and gangrene set in. His son, 32-year-old Washington Roebling, took over. He was a Civil War hero and an engineer. It was he who figured out that to build the gigantic stone towers, workers would have to go underwater into special chambers filled with compressed air. Roebling went right along with the laborers. Then he was stricken with an illness that afflicts deep-sea divers. It is called the bends, and it left him partially paralyzed. He was unable to move about and had to supervise from his bed, using binoculars to watch the workmen. His wife, Emily Roebling, went back and forth to the bridge with his daily instructions. When it was finally done, the bridge was called a wonder of the world. Its towers were bigger than any other man-made structure except for the Egyptian pyramids. The bridge was so high that tall ships could glide easily beneath it. Horse-drawn carriages, railroad trains, pedestrians, and an electric tram each had a special roadway on the Brooklyn Bridge. It was the first bridge lit by electricity. People came from all over just to see it. It towered over the buildings on both shores and linked the separate cities of Brooklyn and Manhattan into a united New York. Americans felt, felt that if they could build a wondrous bridge like this one, they could do anything. In 1883, New York City had its biggest party ever. Fireworks filled the sky. President Chester A. Arthur cut the ribbon that officially opened the bridge. Then the president went to Washington Roebling's bedside to thank him on behalf of the nation.